Let's go ahead and continue on in our uh, in our study here. We're, we, we were considering interpretation. Let me go back and repeat our our uh, definition of interpretation. That's the right page there. It's the act of the servants of God, whereby they pursue the explanation of the truth of the Word of God by normal standards of understanding written language. And so I, I guess there are differences between, you know, understanding spoken language and written language. But in, in any case, uh, we went over that. We, we considered that, you know, there is, of course, a difference between interpretation of languages and what we mean by interpretation of scriptures. Because, you know, we all speak English, but when, you know, some people can't make any sense of, uh, you know, somebody like uh, Shakespeare. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you know because of just the way he wrote. So some parts of the Bible we need to be honest and say some parts of the Bible are hard to understand. The apostle Peter in Second Peter chapter three, uh, he said that the apostle Paul had written things that were hard to understand. And so that's one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit compares the body. Uh, the, the body of Christ, which is the church, to the human body. And uh, to me, this is why I can't accept the idea of a universal church. And I have some good friends who believe in the universal church, believe strongly in it. But I can't accept it because every figure, everything that the Bible compares the church to, whether it's a bride or a body or a building, and those are the three things that the church is compared to in Scripture, we, we can't, even in our most creative moments, imagine a universal bride, a universal body, and a universal building. Uh, that it just, that's, that doesn't make any sense. And so the whole idea of something that's supposed to be universal and visible and mysterious, it, it's, it's an idea that's foreign scripture. You, you can't really find it in the Bible. You have to put it there. You have to put it there. And uh, But you can see the local church being a body and every member of the church having some task to perform. So just like the human body with fingers and ears and nose and eyes and legs and arms and head and all the different parts of our body. And if we lose a part, then we become handicapped. We're not as effective. We're not as... Uh, able to perform work tasks as a church that God has given us. We're not, we're not as, as, as able to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're, we're not able to reach our Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world because parts of the body are able. They're absent without leave. Right. They, they, they decided that they don't want to be with the rest of the body. And so that, that's, uh, that's why I, I just can't buy the whole universal church thing. To me, everybody I've met who was a universal church person, uh, they tend to have this sort of like diminished view of the local church. They, they think that the local church is corrupted and is sinful and is evil and the universal church is this thing that's pure and good and great and holy and all that. Well, that pure and great and good and holy thing isn't doing you any good. Right. Nobody, was ever, nobody is ever in any way made better by being part of something that's invisible, mysterious, and universal. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, nobody from that church is going to come and visit you. If, you did, if they do, you won't know it. <laughs> You know, they're not going to they're not going to put an arm around your shoulder when you're in grief. They're not going to bring you a bag of groceries when you're hungry. They're not going to uh, you, you know, they're not going to uh, make you laugh when you're sad. So we all need we all need each other. That's right. We all need each other. Come right on in, sister. Good to see you. Uh, so that's why I just can't by the whole universal church thing because there's no practical value to it. And, and in fact, 
it, it, it diminishes from the local church because now there are people who say, well, I'm not going to give tithes to, my, uh, to the church that I'm a member of. Instead, I send my tithe to this place or that place or this person or that ministry over there, something like that. And uh, they don't even know really what's going on in those things. Right. I mean, I remember, you know, the Wounded Warrior Project. How many times has that thing been busted for misuse? And it's terrible. Those people need the help. They need the help. But there's safety in giving in the local church because you're part of that church. I love that old saying, do your giving where you're living and you'll be knowing where it's going. Amen. So uh, that's what I, you know, uh, I'm not condemning everybody in the Southern Baptist Convention by any means because there are some wonderful, wonderful people in the Southern Baptist Convention, but their Southern Baptist money from some really good people is going to Baylor University that supports homosexuality. It just is. There's, you know, it's, it's sad. It really is. But that kind of thing isn't going to happen in, in a, a, a church organization like this. Because if it did, then you have the right as a member to stand up and say, what's going on here? According to the Bible, that's not right. We ought not to be doing it. And so, uh, but when people aren't a member of uh, a, a, a local church and they, they say, well, I don't have to be a member of the local church because I'm a member of the Church Universal... They're, what they're really doing is they're saying, I don't want to submit myself to other people. Because when we're in a, a membership in a church, there's mutual submission. We're all in submission to one another. And we all recognize that we need one another. We need one another. And so uh, the body of Christ is just, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. And, it, and it, it, it grieves my heart to see how some Christian people minimize that thing that could make their life so much better if they were only submitted to it, if they only uh, would do that. And all of this has great bearing on, on our topic on the Word of God. Uh, because if you, if you can't get that right, is there any hope that you'll you'll get much right in the Word of God if you can't get that right? Uh, interpreting the Bible is tremendously significant and important. And uh, so we went over some some things. Let's uh, keep going on this and see how much more we can get in the next fifteen minutes. I kind of got uh, delayed a little bit on, uh, but it's that's an important topic. And uh, so interpretation is the believer's attempt to determine the exact meaning of a uh, of a biblical passage. And of course that presupposes that, that a passage in the Bible has but one true meaning. Now I understand that there are passages in the Bible where, and we looked at the example when, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and he said, uh, this is that which was spoken by Joel. But when you read the passage in Joel, you see that it's talking about cosmic disturbances, the sun being, being darkened, the moon turned to blood, and so forth. None of that has happened. But Revelation says it will happen in the future, in the tribulation period, when Christ opens those seals in that seven-sealed book. Then those cosmic disturbances are going to happen. So, but Peter said this is that. So there are some passages in the Bible that have double reference. In other words, yes, it was partially fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, Joel's prophecy in Joel chapter 3, I believe, and it's going to be partially fulfilled in, in well, uh, it's going to be completely fulfilled, I should say, in, uh, in, in Revelation. But there are other passages too. Uh, here's a really good example. Um, the, you know that uh, God told Abraham, Take thy son Isaac, whom thou lovest, thy only son, and take him, and he was supposed to go to Mount Moriah, which is, of course, Mount Moriah's, you know, that's, that's Calvary. <laughs> Calvary and yep. Temple. And all yep. That. Take, him, take him to Mount Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice. And he took Isaac and he bound him and he put the wood in order and he took the knife and he was about to kill his only son believing that God would raise him from the dead. Right. 
And God said, Lay not thy hand to thy son, the Lord hath provided himself a lamb. Now that create, creates a problem, you know, what in 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 English we can say that exactly how it's said in the Hebrew. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. But in Korean, they can't exactly say it that way. They can only say the Lord will provide an alternative lamb, or the Lord will be the lamb. Nice. One or the other. Which one is it? <laughs> both. Because both are true, exactly. Both are true. The Lord did provide an alternative. He found that sheep with its that ram with its horn caught in the thicket. That was the alternative. But Jesus Christ is the Lamb. Right. So both were true. Both were true. But we don't have the right to impose, you know, and say, okay, I know that uh, you know the Bible says this, but I think it means something completely different. And uh, when you look at a lot of uh, reformed theology, especially as it relates to prophecy. It's like everybody has their own idea, and it's crazy. Uh, I have somewhere in my notes, I have a, a, a bulletin from a Presbyterian church over in Noangu, and they had a, a Scottish Presbyterian missionary from Scotland. And, and uh, two weeks after 9-11 in 2001, he preached a sermon in which he said that uh, New York City was was the, the 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 towers being crashed down by the terrorists in, in New York City was the fulfillment of Revelation. And he said, you know, that the seven hills, the city with seven hills was with those seven hills were the seven towers of the World Trade Center. And I didn't even like I thought there was only two, you know. But he said there was actually seven buildings in the World Trade Center. The other ones were much smaller, only two of them were big. And they were, of course, when the other towers fell on top of them. But you know what? That's, that is just absolute insanity. Yes. That's absolute craziness. But somebody who was actually in that service took the bulletin and brought it to me because they knew that I was a pastor and said... This is what our pastor preached on Sunday. It seems pretty weird to me. What do you think? <laughs> I said, you need to find a new pastor. Yeah. I said, this guy doesn't even know what the Bible is saying. He's, he's, he's taking his, I guess, socialism. And, and anyways, uh, he, he was convinced that there was no greater, more evil city in the world than New York City. I have no idea what the evilest city in the world is. I don't think New York is any worse than London. I don't, I don't think New York City is any worse than Moscow. I don't think that it's any worse than most big cities. Uh, but this guy was convinced that, you know, uh, that the book of Revelation and all the horrors of the seven seals were all basically, uh, that, that all took place on 9-11. So uh, the way that some people interpret the Bible is a mystery. And uh, probably he's changed his interpretation since then. Uh, because there's no consistency to it at all. So interpretation is not something that's mystical or magical or esoteric. Uh, God's will and purpose for man was written clearly and sensibly so that any regenerated individual could come to the Bible and be taught directly by the Holy Spirit of God. If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, I think uh, you, can, you can eventually come to a right conclusion at, absent of pride. Because... As soon as we as believers have pride in our heart, we'll find that God resists us. God always is going to resist the proud, and He's going to give grace to the humble. But some people, you can't ever tell them they're wrong. There are some people who are not teachable. They don't even want to be taught by the Holy Spirit of God. No, but if you can't be taught by man, you're certainly not going to be taught by... If you can't be taught by a godly man, uh, you're not going to learn anything from the Holy Spirit of God either. So... Now, good interpretation involves a normal grammatical, contextual, theological method of understanding the Word of God. And uh, I emphasize that almost every time I preach, that we have to understand the Bible in the context in which it's given. Because if you take a verse out of its context, you can teach any crazy thing in the world you want. And many people do that. 
Many people do that. You can't do that. You have to look at it in the context that, that it's given. And, uh, you know, that's another reason why I believe in the local church, because Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, or he was writing to the church at Ephesus. And so we just have to understand uh, things in the context in which the Holy Spirit of God chose to put those words. Poor interpretation is commonly done by both liberals and compromising evangelicals. Uh, uses the historical critical method of interpretation. Sometimes that's also called redaction theory or source criticism. And uh, uh, they don't believe in uh, that God has perfectly preserved his word. They, they just believe that there are words out there, but we don't know what is the what is from God and what was changed by man and what what has you know passed away so that nobody has it anymore and uh, you know I, that's a pretty dim view of God if you think that God isn't strong enough and isn't powerful enough to preserve His Word uh, then I, I think you need a, you need a greater a greater faith now there are some qualifications uh, to, for interpretation. Uh, so let's consider these real quickly. No one can fully understand what God's Word means until he's been born again. So we looked at that uh, passage in 1 uh, first, first, uh, uh, Corinthians chapter uh, 4. Uh, that, I think it's chapter 4. Uh, that uh, uh, the natural man understandeth not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Uh, you have to, you have to be saved. You'll never under God's word will never make sense to you uh, until you have uh, been born again. And uh, then there's there's also another thing, uh, and that is uh, you. Oh, it's chapter two, verses fourteen and fifteen. Chapter two, verses Second Corinthians, chapter two. No, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. I'm looking right at the 2, and so I said 2. But it's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 and 15. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So, first of all, you have to be saved. And then, number 2, you need a reverence for God's Word. A reverence for God's Word. A genuine and earnest desire to know God's Word. This isn't passive. There's a lot of people that, according to their testimony, they're saved. But I don't really think they have any reverence for God's Word. They don't have any earnest desire in their heart to understand and to know God's Word. And uh, so that's also necessary. And then an earnest prayer life is necessary because it reveals the spirit of humility. Prayer isn't, prayer isn't how we get God to do what we want. Prayer is how God gets us ready to use us. Uh, prayer is so important because prayer is how God uses us. And uh, so if you don't pray, it's unlikely that you're going to understand the difficult parts of God's work. Number four, the interpreter must approach Scripture with a willingness to obey what it teaches. Uh, people pray for God's will. Lord, would you show me what your will is as long as it's not to be a missionary? Uh, then I'll do it. Uh, well, your prayer is vain because God isn't going to show you. Even if it isn't God's will for you to be a missionary, God's just not going to show you because if you're not willing to do whatever God wants you to do, then God's not going to give you greater light. If you won't walk in the light that's already been given, God's not going to give you additional light. He may even take away some of the light that you already have. And uh, that, that happens quite a lot. There, there also has to be a willingness to study. God has chosen to let some facts about the Bible be learned independently of its own pages. And uh, this kind of study is demanding. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot about the Bible by studying history. I've learned a lot about the Bible by studying archaeology. I've learned a lot about the Bible by studying geography. Uh, just being able to hear 
a name of a city or a country and being able to put it on a map in your head and to know where it is, it helps make sense of some things in the Bible. And uh, so, but those kinds of things, you know, you have to study before you can uh, really, uh, before all the pieces of the puzzle will fit in place. I'll say it that way. Then the interpreter should be very wary of coming to the Bible with preconceived prejudices. And uh, I, to a certain extent, we, we all come to the Bible with preconceptions. And some preconceptions are, are healthy. We come to the Bible believing that God is. We come to the Bible believing that it is God's Word, that God gave us the Bible, that He's speaking to us. If you don't have those things, uh, first of all, I don't even think you, you can't even be saved without that. You can't be saved without believing that, there, that God is, and you can't be saved without believing that the Bible is the Word of God. You can't be saved without believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior. Uh, but So those are all preconceptions because the Bible doesn't seek to prove that God exists. The Bible assumes that God exists. That's right. uh, the Bible can be a tremendous book of apologetics, that is, defending the existence of God, but, it, but it, that's not what it was given for. It was given to believers and to those who would believe to show what God wants us to know. Then the believer, the interpreter, has to depend upon the Holy Spirit of God. Infallibility and inerrancy are characteristics of the Bible, but not of any interpreter. Amen. Even the greatest, the greatest men of God, at times, got things wrong. They misunderstood things. And uh, so, uh, we might do the same. It might be that we do the same. I tell people all the time, uh, if you want to know what I believe, I'll tell you. If you think that I'm wrong, then you have to be prepared to show me from the Bible how I'm wrong. If you start telling me what Calvin says, I'm turning you right off. I don't care what Calvin says. I don't care what Luther says. I don't care what the London Confession of 1639 says. Show me If I'm wrong, show me from the Bible while I, why I'm wrong. Uh, because I'm fairly confident that I can show you from the Bible everything that I believe. And we all should be able to do, do that. The Holy Spirit, so work in interpretation, doesn't include private interpretation or hidden meanings that are different from the normal, literal meaning of a passage. And, uh, and then the Holy Spirit, um, someone who's living in sin... I think that they're almost certainly likely to misinterpret the Bible uh, to justify their sin because their heart is not right with God. Their mind is not in harmony with the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit guides believers into all truth. John 16, 13. Thy word is truth. And the passage is a promise. This passage in John 16, 13. Let me just read it real quick and then we'll probably close on that. Um, John 16, 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Uh, we need to remember that these words were given to Christ's disciples before the New Testament was given. So uh, when you read these things and, and where it says uh, you don't have to worry what to say in that day because the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. Uh, that That's not really for us. We should study and prepare what we're going to say ahead of time and we, because we it's the Bible that we should be studying. And uh, so uh, the, the, the Spirit indwells all believers and therefore all believers can come to a correct understanding of the Bible. Not all do. But that's because interpretation is not the private domain of some elite class of scholars. Guys who have PhDs, guys who have been to a certain Bible college, whatever. Uh, anyone can come to the understanding of truth, even if they only had a fourth grade education. So, uh, we'll go ahead and close in that and get ready for the morning service. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your